Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to this month's MAP webinar. I'm joined in the room here, this is Dan Barry, by the way, and I'm joined in the room here by a bunch of fisheries friends, so thank you all for, for coming to this. Um, we have a, a webinar today that's co-sponsored with Fisheries, um, uh, Office of Science and Technology, National Marine Fisheries Service, and uh, the, the title is Marine Fisheries Forecasting and Projecting Health and Resource Availability. So um, I'd like to thank Roger Griffiths for helping to co-sponsor this and also uh, for suggesting some speakers and thanks also to Tron Christensen who, um, who helped with suggesting speakers for this webinar. So um, for those of you who haven't been on a MAP webinar before, the way we work this is we have three 15-minute talks and we usually have about five minutes for questions between talks. And um, we do questions online using the uh, raise hand feature. So everyone's muted on the phone right now. And what you should do is, is raise your hand in WebEx um, in order to indicate that you have a question. I'll unmute your line. You can ask your question and have a dialogue with the speaker. Um, the way to get to the raise hand feature is to go into the participant list. You'll see a, a logo at the bottom of the participant list that you can click and raise your hand. Make sure to put your hand back down after uh, your question is answered. And uh, we have three speakers. So we're going to hear first from Charlie Stock, who is at the NOAA Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory. And um, Charlie's going to talk about some efforts to do seasonal to decadal prediction for marine resources. Um, we're going to then hear from Janet Nye from Stony Brook University, who's going to be looking at a little bit longer time scale, more on the projections time scale. Uh, centennial and, and talking about projections of changes um, in fish, fisheries, and marine ecosystems because of climate change. And then uh, finally, Ann Hollowood from the uh, NOAA Alaska Fisheries Science Center, who's going to be talking about um, their efforts to develop climate-ready commercial fisheries up in the uh, Pacific marine ecosystem in the, in the Northeast uh, Pacific. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Charlie. Charlie, are you on the line? Okay, great. So I'm transferring control over your computer right now. Yeah, it looks good. So whenever you're ready, go ahead. Great. Um, uh, thanks, Dan. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I'm going to be talking about seasonal to decadal scale climate predictions for marine resource management. And this project is part of a broader set of activities at uh, GFDL and uh, together with our colleagues and NOAA and, and academic colleagues at RAIN, that connecting climate and marine ecosystems uh, over a range of spatial and temporal scales in support of NOAA's Next Generation Strategic Plan. Uh, I'm going to present, the pro present it, but it's really on behalf of the project team and collaborators. Um, the project itself was an OAR Special Early Stage Experimental or Development Project, or SEED project. Uh, and I also had additional support from uh, NIMS s &T, so special thanks to, to Ned Sear and Roger Griffiths for their steadfast support. Um, uh, myself, Gabe Becky, and Desiree Tomasi at GFDL or PIs, together with Mike Alexander, Kathy Pijan, and Kathy Pijan from Ezreal, uh, who's Kathy is now at George Mason, uh, Nick Bond, uh, PMEL, and Yan Zhu uh, with NSEP CPC. Uh, we're also leveraging and building upon a variety of uh, NIMS and uh, NOS collaborations that I'll mention uh, during the talk. Uh, but I'll start by mentioning Paula Fratton, Tony, Todd O'Brien, and Tron Christensen have contributed uh, to the initial work that I'll describe uh, today. There are three broad tasks as part of this project. The first is to assess uh, seasonal decadal predictability of ecosystem relevant climate variables. Uh, communicate the results and build capacity across NOAA through a workshop that's going to be June 3rd to 5th at, at Princeton, and then develop case study applications uh, of seasonal to decadal climate predictions uh, to marine resource science and management. And, and these are three very broad tasks, and clearly, you know, accomplishing these completely is beyond the scope of, a, of, any, of any single project. But our hope is, you know, in, in, in uh, consistency with, with this, the idea of the SEED project is by addressing a few uh, strategic uh, advances and, and having this workshop and engaging with a broad spectrum of scientists and managers, we can, uh, we can make progress on all three of these fronts. And we've started uh, our work on all three of these fronts, but I'm going to focus today on the first, which is assessing seasonal decadal predictability of ecosystem relevant climate variables. And where we started with this was looking at the predictability of sea surface temperature anomalies in shelf ecosystems uh, from these global prediction systems. Now, as many of you know, SST anomalies are both leading indicators and important drivers of ecosystem fluctuations. Um, 
Uh, but assessment of SSG predictions has been strongly skewed towards space and scale variations such as ENSO, and really SSG prediction itself is often viewed as a precursor to predicting regional air temperature and precip anomalies, which are, are often considered more user relevant. But for marine resources, of course, SSG anomalies are of direct interest, and predictions along continental margins are essential because that's where most of our fisheries resources and, and tourism values are realized. Now, there are a number of challenges with this. First, uh, global SST reanalyses that are often used as observations and prediction studies um, can be challenged in coastal systems and, and, and often don't do well at very small scales. Uh, course resolution of global forecast systems, often of the order of a degree in latitude and longitude, may degrade coastal forecast skill. And prominent sources of unpredictable local variation may swamp signals from more predictable large scale patterns. So with this first study, we were really interested in how these different factors played out and ultimately how useful are global SST anomaly predictions uh, to LMR management and, and living marine resource management in coastal systems. For our approach, we, we use the concept of large marine ecosystems to help synthesize predictability across coastal systems. Large marine ecosystems or LMEs are coherent ocean areas, generally along continental margins. These ecological systems are characterized by similarities of bathymetry, hydrography, biological productivity, and whose plant and animal populations are inextric inextricably linked uh, to one another through the food chain. Uh, these uh, systems uh, have been used successfully uh, for ecosystem-based management applications in the past. And while one could quibble with the details of the boundaries of these systems, they have been have proven useful. Uh, in addition, SST anomalies are generally coherent over the LME scale. If you look at the anomalies, Across these systems, they generally are coherent at the level of about 0.7 to 0.8 in terms of correlation with the LME mean. So it's a useful uh, averaging uh, scale. Uh, the seven I've shown here, we take a focused look at the Eastern Bering Sea, the Gulf of Alaska, the California Current, the Insular Pacific and Hawaiian Islands, Gulf of Mexico, Northeast US, and Southeast US. After a detailed look at these in the paper, we actually telescope out to all 64 LMAs globally, but I'm going to focus on these ones today. So as I said, the first challenge is convincing ourselves that we have an accurate estimate of retrospective SST anomalies at the scales of these LMAs. So what we did was extracted raw World Ocean Database uh, 2013 data for, for all, of, all of those uh, US LMAs I just showed. Um, and then we sampled the Reynolds High Resolution OIS v 2 product at each of the observation points in the World Ocean Database. We then subtracted a common reference climatology from those two sets of points, bend them in each LME, and, and created monthly climatologies of these two alternative um, estimates of uh, LME scale SST anomalies. And what you see here is that for six of the seven systems, we actually haven't done the Hawaiian system quite yet on this, for six of the seven systems, the Reynolds-based uh, anomalies and the raw anomalies based on the World Ocean Database information show a high degree of correlation and amplitudes that are generally uh, consistent, um, very little damping. The only system where we, we uh, detected some degradation was for the Southeast United States where there was low correlation and evidence of significant damping. So it seems that for, for six of the seven systems, the, the Reynolds uh, optimally interpolated SST product at quarter degree is providing a consistent estimate with raw data uh, at the scales of interest for this study. Uh, in the southeast US, we're not quite there. This is the smallest of the LMEs and also happens to border uh, the Gulf Stream, which is a highly energetic current. You can imagine um, uh, potential aliasing between those two systems. We have to look into this in more detail. So really now I'm going to focus on six of the seven for which we have some confidence that that Reynolds is doing a pretty good job at, at, at representing the actual uh, retrospective anomalies. We'll look at two forecast systems, uh, GFDL4 forecast system and NSEP CFSB2. For each of these forecast systems, there's been large ensembles of retrospective forecasts done where they, you know, say initialize a forecast in 1982 and try and predict forward into 1982 and 83, repeat the process for every month and every year over the past 30 years or so. And this provides us with a basis for assessing forecast skill. And my thanks to all the, the researchers, both the GFBL and NSEP, who put a tremendous amount of time and effort into uh, creating these retrospective hindcasts, which are essential to really uh, validating uh, the, the predictions. The main differences between the models are that the GFBL4 model is uh, 
a slightly more investment and atmospheric resolution at this point, whereas the NTEP CFSB2 is a slightly larger investment in oceanic resolution. Now, one might think for, for continental shells, the oceanic resolution may be uh, absolutely essential, but one also needs to realize that the, the modes of climate variability that we're trying to predict are really coupled ocean atmosphere modes, or modes that are intrinsic to the atmosphere and filtered to the ocean. So, a priori, it's not clear uh, where the best investment in resolution is. Um, in reality, we found that for different LMEs, different systems may do slightly better than the other, but generally the differences between the forecast systems were smaller than the differences between the different large marine ecosystems in terms of predictability. So for purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on the different patterns, the different large marine ecosystems within GFDL floor. Uh, however, in the paper, we'll have both forecast systems evaluated. Um, and as a note, you can obtain the data that we use for this from, um, from the NMME website sponsored by CPC NCEP. So for those interested in looking in more detail, the data is there through that mechanism. So let's start with it. Let's, I'm going to try and finish with just a quick tour of the realized skill in these, in these different systems. And I'm going to show a number of plots that look like this. So I'll spend a little bit of time explaining what they show now. Um, What's shown on, the, on, on, on this side here, the left-hand side, is the persistence, the anomaly correlation coefficient of a persistence forecast. So that's simply taking the anomaly of the year, the month prior to the forecast, and allowing that anomaly to propagate out into the future. Um, on the y-axis here are the different forecast lead times and months, so going from 1 to 12 months. And on the x-axis are the different forecast initialization months going from January uh, to December. So you can see in the Gulf of Alaska that even a persistence forecast is often giving you a considerable skill out, uh, say, two to four months, where you see these uh, red values uh, indicating a, a significant, uh, a fairly high positive correlation. Plot on the right shows the same set of forecasts, but for the GFDL4 dynamical forecast system. Um, you can uh, see qualitatively that there already is quite a bit more red in many of these areas. The different symbols here, the, the gray dots, indicate that the anomaly correlation coefficient is significantly greater than zero after adjusting for autocorrelation. Uh, the white triangles indicate that the, auto the anomaly correlation coefficient is significantly greater than the persistence forecast. When the red triangle points upward, it means that the correlation is also above 0.5. So really these, these upward pointing uh, white triangles are indicators of both high skill and high skill above persistence. Uh, for, for the uh, Gulf Alaska, you know, one of the, the main prominent features here is this diagonal, diagonal ridge of fairly high skill and high skill above persistence, and it actually corresponds to February, March predictions initialized anywhere from April through to December. And in the paper, we, we spend quite a bit of time looking into each case of high skill above persistence and looking at the mechanisms. I'll talk a little bit about these here. Um, in the Gulf of Alaska, the key seems the, the key is really capturing a seasonal transition between summer and fall periods when the variability in the Gulf of Alaska is dominated by local sources of variation and the February-March period where these large basin scale modes start to emerge and become more prominent. It's essentially illustrated in this figure here where panel A shows the correlation between the Gulf of Alaska anomaly and anomalies over the Pacific Basin. And you can see this kind of signature feature of both ENSO, the extratropical effects of ENSO and PDO where you have high correlations with the equatorial region and high negative correlations with the offshore regions of the Pacific, and then your fall August period where, where everything is much more localized. And really, the model's ability to capture that transition uh, underlies the skill above persistence you see in those February March forecast timeframes. In the California current, not surprisingly, we see a very similar pattern. It's not quite as strong as the Gulf of Alaska, but you see, again, considerable skill over short time scales and persistence which is largely matched or slightly exceeded by the dynamical forecast, and then a similar ridge of predictability in, for forecasts in the winter and early spring. Not quite as significant as for the California current, but, but notable. In Hawaii, we actually see some of the highest skill above persistence. You see this large uh, 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 region of high skill corresponding to fall, winter initialized forecasts going out into the um, into the following spring. And if you look in more detail at the mechanisms behind that, you see it's really corresponding to a large scale reorganization of oceanic fronts in conjunction with seasonal changes over the North Pacific Basin. The plot on the left here shows 
the, auto, the correlation of the um, uh, January to March forecast with the September initialization, where you can see that uh, January to March conditions in the Insular Pacific and Hawaiian Islands are correlated with conditions north of those regions in September. And then those northward regions uh, tend to propagate to the south via a combination of infection and uh, atmospheric fluxes as you move into the winter. You can also note that the effect of this is not the same across the LMEs. So this is, this is one region where we need to be careful about using LMEs as scales of, as scales of averaging. Moving quickly to the Bering Sea, uh, you see there's a large amount of skill uh, in both persistence and the dynamical forecast. The dynamical forecast rarely exceeds persistence by a significant margin here. One of the more interesting features is that there are many forecasts initialized in the late uh, summer and early um, and, and fall, which lose skill during the winter months, which is this pocket here, and then regain it as one moves into spring and, um, and summer, the early summer. Now, if you look at the mechanisms that underlie that, essentially sea ice is serving as a reservoir for propagating SST anomalies across the winter season. What's shown here is the observed anomaly in, the, um, in that following uh, spring season. The black line is the forecast anomaly. You can see the, the, the correlation here, I think, is about 0.7. The gray dashed line is actually a sea ice mass anomaly in the forecast system. And, and you can see a strong negative correlation between that and the eventual SST anomaly the following year. So sea ice is serving as this propagation reservoir, which is causing this predictability to reemerge actually in both the persistence and the, the dynamical forecast run. And the presence of these sort of mechanisms in the Arctic gives one cause for optimism for Arctic uh, sea ice predictability. And of course, sort of the parallel to this mechanism has actually been noted for Arctic sea ice in terms of lending predictability from one year to the other. Um, the predictions are challenged on the smaller LMEs along the northeast, uh, along the uh, U.S. east coast, showing the northeast here where both persistence and the dynamical forecast actually have much more modest skill. And this is probably a region where the resolution is coming into play in terms of an inability to capture the detailed mechanisms, which are connecting the basin scale modes of variability in the North Atlantic, which are quite prominent, to the shelf scale variation over the small scales of the east coast uh, LMEs. In the Gulf of Mexico, we have a little bit more success, um, which is which is um, gives cause for optimism, given that Gulf of Mexico is, is really an inland sea uh, surrounded by land masses, so uh, which is not particularly well resolved here. But there are actually two regions where you have skill above persistence. The first is a ridge that really stretches in the fall months, starting here and moving down uh, into into this region, and that really corresponds to an emergence of Atlantic tropical SST variability that produces a modest, um, a modest skill relative to the observed anomalies in, in the fall months. There's a second region of predictability in the spring, uh, the winter to spring months, as you see in this diagonal here, which corresponds to an ENSO teleconnection where the effects of ENSO are propagating through atmospheric teleconnections and giving a modest amount of, of skill uh, for a February, March uh, condition. So, Concluding thoughts from this study, we found that the forecast skill varies widely by large marine ecosystem initialization month lead time and to some degree the forecast systems. However, there were many cases with high skill that also exceeds persistence. And when we look across all 64 large marine ecosystems, this confirms that there are other cases out there that are even greater skill than the ones I'm showing. Diverse mechanisms were responsible for the skill. I, I highlighted a few here, but there are several more in the paper. Uh, Successfully capturing this interplay between local sources of variability and basin scale sources of variability as a reflective ecosystem is usually a common thread behind these mechanisms. We had a lot less luck with other variables that we looked at. SST is, is probably our most well observed property. Uh, it's constrained most well retrospectively and actually predicted fairly well into the future. Uh, sea surface salinity, for example, uh, the the retrospective estimates couldn't agree, could, didn't even agree with one another. So for other variables, we're, we're, we have a lot more work to do get, to get to the point where we're even starting to look at the predictions. Moving forward, the key question is, what's the value of this information uh, for management? Now, there are a number of pioneering applications of, of SST predictions in the context of coral reefs, uh, improving the efficiency of fishing fleets and bycatch avoidance and hypoxia. Uh, some of these arise out of NOAA, many arise out of one particular group in Australia. And one of the 
key goals of this work is to try and expand the number of case studies and fully realize the potential for translating this future information about environmental state into more efficient and effective management. And Desiree Tomasi, the postdoc on the project, is, is heading this effort and developing a number of case studies in U.S. waters in collaboration with fisheries and academic collaborators. These will be uh, presented along with other results on a workshop June 3rd to 5th at Princeton. Um, uh, and, and we have a number of representatives across the line office who have already agreed to come and speak at that. But if anyone else in the room uh, is interested or listening online is interested, uh, please contact myself and, and Desiree, who are, we have listed our emails at the bottom of the uh, page. With that, I think I'm done. Um, so thanks very much for your attention. Great. Thanks a lot, Charlie. That was really enlightening. Um, so for those, well, we already have a question on, on, online. Um, it, anyone in the room have a question for Charlie while I queue this question up? Okay, so we have a question from Eric Baylor. So Eric, I've unmuted your line. Feel free to go ahead and ask your question. Yes, um, my question is in, in discussing the correlation with sea ice. Um, hello? Yeah, we can hear okay. you, Eric. Okay, I'm just getting some feedback. That's all. Uh, what is meant by the sea ice anomaly? Are you talking about in terms of extent or duration or thickness? Uh, sea ice mass is what, uh, what was plotted on that. Um, what was plotted on that uh, plot so really a combination of extent and, and thickness. And, and uh, um, I, I think the, it all, we also plotted uh, the sea ice mass during the peak sea ice period. So um, I'm sure we could parse that in more detail. Uh, but it was the ice mass rather than just the extent that we were looking at. The reason I ask this is because as NOAA starts to focus more on the Arctic, um, the observations, I'm from NESDIT, so we're trying to figure out how best and who would be potential users of sea ice thickness extent uh, and uh, observations. Um, and I have a second question. In regards to your sea surface temperature um, information there, you're, you're, you're comparing it with the Reynolds OISST. What kind of resolution, in spatial, both spatially and temporal, are you looking for in the ops? You, look, you indicated that the uh, Reynolds SST is at a quarter degree, but we collect observations at a much greater resolution than that, typically down yeah, to four kilometers or one kilometer. So, yeah, Re Re Reynolds is a, is a quarter degree global. The, the Reynolds OISST version 2 is a quarter degree uh, global product, um, and, and it's based on optimal interpolation. And I think the, the kind of decorrelation scales they use vary by latitude and, and, and uh, location, but generally are of order 50 to 150 kilometers in terms of trying to blend, blend data sets uh, uh, appropriately. So, so the question was, was whether that was good enough to capture um, the LME scale variations that, that we were interested in. Uh, so the, the technique we, we Applied there was to was to compare it relative to the anomalies that arose from using the raw unprocessed data sets, which, which as you said, probably uh, arose from a variety of uh, resolutions. Now, I know that that NODC is involved in a number of uh, projects that are aimed at creating very high resolution regional climatologies, which could probably be optimized beyond um, beyond the global Reynolds OSST approach. Um, but I'd have to, you know, I'd have to defer to, to the NODC folks to, to, to kind of tell us where they're headed. I think the good news was that, you know, in general, I think Reynolds, the high-res Reynolds product, did fairly well at the LME scale that, that this analysis was interested in. Now, someone else may be interested in with a much finer scale uh, perturbation, and for that, I think you'll need to go to even more localized data sets. So I think, I think the key message, though, for using any of these is just to make sure you. you assess whatever product you use as observations against local SST observations at the finest scale you have to understand the limitations of that and not just accept it as observations before any evaluation. Okay, one quick last question. On your correlations, what was the level of significance and what, what was the threshold for statistical significance? For, for, the, uh, for the Reynolds? Um, well, for, Reynolds? for your various plots. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, uh, these, these 90% um, confidence, uh, and it was a Fisher Z transform test, and we adjusted for autocorrelation using uh, Bretherton. Thank you. Uh, Eric, thanks for the questions. Please make sure you put your hand back down in the participant list.
Um, so we have to move on to the next speaker. Charlie, thanks a lot for the presentation. It was very interesting. Next Thank speaker you. is Janet Nye from Stony Brook. Janet, are you on the line? Hi, yeah, can you hear me? Janet, I'm transferring control over to your computer right now. Okay. So just click the, yeah, there you go. Okay, so you can see that right now? That looks good. So go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, projecting the impacts of climate change on fish, fisheries, and marine ecosystems. And so I'm going to, what I'm going to do is just give a broad overview of published studies in which um, we've used IPCC class global climate models in fisheries applications or in marine ecosystem um, applications. Um, so probably one of the first studies was done by William Chung, who projected uh, the impacts of climate change on global biodiversity of fish and macroinvertebrates. And um, this was a tremendous effort, and the focus was really on, again, global biodiversity. Um, William and colleagues used one global climate model, the GFDL CM2.1, and he's a very a relatively simple model of population growth. Um, he's representing um, hundreds to thousands of species in the in this modeling effort. So he had to use a, a simple model of growth for that would work well for each of the species. And he took a bioclimatic envelope approach, which um, talk about a little bit more later. But um, basically, this approach um, you take the distribution of a species and um, look at the observed distribution in relation to sea surface temperature, salinity, and other environmental factors to um, get a statistical model of the environmental preferences for each species. Um, and so if you look to uh, at these panels, this is the re results from William Chung's work, or some of them, in which he shows globally species invasions, local extinctions, and sort of the sum of those two processes, um, species turnover. And um, again, the focus was global in scope, um, so he didn't focus on individual species. However, he did provide projections of, he does have projections of each species that he examined. Um, and so this is just one example for Atlantic cod, and you can see that in comparison to year one, 30 years, projecting 30 years in the future, um, Atlantic cod has higher abundance um, off, the co off the shores of, of Russia, where previously it was not as abundant. And you see lower abundances in the North Sea and the Northeast Shelf, um, which have been historically really important fishing grounds, of course. Um, so this was a study global in scope. But um, many of the studies since then are really focused on species that we know for which we have a lot of information about. And um, I've been focused on single species. So this was um, a study published relatively um, soon after that on Atlantic cod by Mike Fogarty and colleagues. They used three climate models, um, GFDL, Hadley, and PCM. They conducted a, they looked at sea surface temperature from the GCM, and then they conducted a linear regression between the bottom temperature and sea surface temperature that was observed in, in the northeast U.S. And then they were able to take the sea surface temperature from the GCM and convert to bottom temperature for four regions and two seasons. Um, so this was one of the first attempts to use IPCC class model. And this is what you get. The effects of temperature um, were incorporated into cod growth and recruitment. Um, recruitment is re sort of reproductive success for the non-fishery scientists in the room. Um, and so what what they got they got was a uh, typical yield um, curve. And you can see the yield for cod historically was very high. And then with a one or two degree temperature increase, the yield over different levels of fishing pressure uh, declined. And they also projected changes in distribution, although I won't show the results for that. Um, sort of in contrast to that, another study conducted by John Hare, Mike Fogarty, and, and colleagues 
was to look at Atlantic croaker, which is a more warm water species in the northeast U.S. Um, and they took a similar approach, although they did, I think, look at 14 different global climate models. And um, what you can see is the opposite effect for Atlantic croaker. So historically, is, is the yield for croaker under different levels of fishing, um, fishing effort shown in gray. And then as um, temperatures warm, you can see that the yield for croaker actually increases. So this is a story that we've been hearing in lots of different ecosystems for different species in that there will be winners like Atlantic croaker and losers like Atlantic cod in the northeast U.S. Um, another approach that has been used to look at the effects of climate change um, on individual species is a distribution-based approach. And this is um, an approach in which you develop a habitat model and then use the IPCC class models to project habitat and perhaps abundance or, um, you know, by projecting habitat we can say something about the resilience or um, potential for population declines or increases under climate change. And typically this approach is better for data poor species in which you need to do a rapid assessment. So these approaches have been conducted for species that have been petitioned under the Endangered Species Act. And um, now when a species is petitioned under ESA, um, the agency has to consider the effects of climate change um, to the future of the species. It also might work for other um, data poor species or highly migratory species like blue and tuna um, or other tuna species. And this is just a figure showing sort of the amount of data that we have for blue and tuna that has a very important um, aspect of its life history is spawning in U.S. Uh, waters in the Gulf of Mexico. But I'm going to um, give you an example of this approach using the cusk. This is the cusk um, shown here. Many of you probably have not heard of this species. It's a, a cold water species that's found in the Gulf of Maine. And as you can see from this picture here, it likes to hang out in rocks and boulders. Um, it's a pretty cryptic species, and it's difficult to sample. And so we don't have a lot of information about this species yet. Um, we do know that its abundance has declined um, pretty drastically recently. So in, um, in um, preparation for potentially this species being petitioned under the Endangered Species Act, we conducted a study to determine how climate change may affect this data for species. And I just want to point out that there are 14 um, co-authors on this study to um, try to assess the impact of climate change on this one species. So this is a, these are very large um, multidisciplinary studies. Um, for cusp, uh, because we knew that it does prefer this rocky bottom type, we had two environmental variables, variables that we used to construct a habitat model. Um, and one was the bottom type, and we considered this to be a static field, a field that would not change with climate change, and then the dynamic field, which would be temperature, and we expect that, of course, to change with climate change. And so we combined these two factors into a habitat model, um, and then we used nine different climate models um, and used a, a delta approach to um, to project forward the, prime, the uh, temperature changes that may occur in the, in the northeast U.S. And by combining this habitat model with our um, projected changes in temperature, we could project the future habitat for cusk, and that, again, has some, we think that has some value in understanding how abundance of this population might respond. Um, for the climate scientists in the room, this is um, an example of how we, um, I call it upscaling actually, not really downscaling for this, for this project. And so we had three regions in which we um, calculated the delta, which was the um, temperature change from the historical time period in the model to two future time periods. And so we averaged across these large boxes. 
And this is what we get. Um, the green areas in this map indicate good potential habitat for cusps. So you can see historically there was a good potential habitat for cusps throughout the entire Gulf of Maine. But then as we increase the temperature, the habitat of cusps declines until you know we virtually have a, a no good habitat for cusps when we get to a temperature decrease of two or three degrees. And this is basically because um, there's a mismatch between the dynamic variable, the temperature that's changing because of climate change, and the static variable, the bottom habitat um, that this fish needs. So basically areas that were favorable in terms of temperature for this fish um, may not coincide with areas that have high complexity habitat. So that's the reason why you see a rapid decline in this fish habitat. And so this is a good example of why it's really important to include other factors um, than temperature in our assessment. Another interesting um, point from this work was that we looked at the different sources of variability um, in, our, in our climate projection, our downscaling technique. And so we had three regions of the New England Gulf of Maine social shelf, three scenarios, A2, A1B, and B1, two time periods, uh, 12 depths, six seasons, seven global climate models. And the two I have highlighted uh, are the greatest sources of variability. Obviously, the time periods so temperature increases um, are higher, as you would expect in the later time period. But also another source of variability is the GCM. So from this, what I took away is, you know, it's important if you can to look at as many climate models as possible. I just want to quickly uh, mention this study, which was, again, one of the um, first studies to try to understand climate change's effect on um, Atlantic cod. Um, they used an individual-based model, which is a highly, um, it's a very um, detailed model of the biological system of cod, and in fact, it's very difficult to do individual-based models um, because we lack the biological data to do these. Uh, they used one GCM, and what I liked about this study was that they used um, a large-scale feature, thermohaline circulation, to look at how that might affect climate change, I mean, might affect um, Arctic Norwegian cod. And I think this, looking at some of these larger-scale processes might be um, a good way forward. And now I'm going to skip through, you know, a lot of other studies that have been conducted and skip straight to what I think is one of the mo more complicated um, ways to look at climate change in of a food web and not just a single species. So this is a recent paper that was um, published by colleagues working on the Baltic Sea ecosystem, and you can see um, this the Baltic Sea ecosystem here, which is represented in this study by Ecopath with Ecosim. Um, and they conducted dynamical downscaling, um, they, and they looked at multiple stressors, nutrient runoff, fishing, and climate. I just want to point out this is a relatively simple food web. They only got three fish species here. Um, and they used one climate model and uh, basically two different scenarios, A1B and A2. And they had multiple regional climate models in their dynamical downscaling approach. And these regional uh, models were able to um, look at different scenarios and how that might affect salinity, temperature, and hypoxia, these other factors that can affect the food web. They looked also at different fishing scenarios and different nutrient load scenarios. Um, so this was basically their approach. And um, they can, I'm not going to go through what each one of these arrows means, but basically they can look for two time periods and determine how um, nutrient regime and fishing would affect, and climate would affect, um, affect this the different components oops, of this ecosystem. Um, so these are here are the nutrient regimes, and then these F1.1 would be high fishing pressure, F1.3 would be low fishing pressure. And so this gives you 
a more realistic and heuristic uh, view of what might happen to this Baltic Sea ecosystem. Um, so, kind of in conclusion, I wanted to, um, you know, in looking at sort of the history of what the studies have been done in the last 10 years to incorporate IPCC class models into ecological assessments. Um, typically, the focus has been on temperature, and you know, temperature is one of the most important factors that impacts cold water species. So the focus has been rightly so on temperature, and it's also one of the most robust changes that we expect to see with climate change. But um, we do need to incorporate additional variables like salinity, infection, and one way to do that is to use Earth system models in which we can look at stratification as well as plankton assemblages, and we know that that's really important for understanding fisheries production. Um, in the past, we focused on means, and again, rightly so, but we know that extremes in temperature and other environmental variables may cause regime shifts and extremes may be ultimately more important in structuring ecosystems than changes in the mean. Um, these projects, you know, at the heart of them is really an issue of scale. So we have these global climate models that are um, designed to forecast the climate for the entire globe, yet as fisheries um, managers and scientists, we want to use these for fire scale models and for regional assessment. So, um, for at least for the Northeast U.S., finer scale model, we're finding that finer scale models do help improve um, our projections and our understanding of how climate change might affect these, the coastal ecosystem of the Northeast U.S., um, but we also need dynamical downscaling to bridge this issue of scale. Um, another way to do this might be to use large-scale oceanographic features. That's why I showed that example of um, thermal haline circulation. Um, and, but we have to use the ones that are well represented in the GCMs and that have been shown to structure ecosystems. Um, and so for both, you know, the ecologists and climate scientists that are working on these um, multidisciplinary approaches, um, we need to move beyond single species and uh, use ecosystem models. And uh, we can do that by using, in part, the Earth system models, which have part of the lower trophic level, and as well as use um, our upper trophic level ecosystem model. And then um, a note, particularly for the ecologists, to use a multi-model model inference approach. Um, you know, obviously climate scientists, I think, have done a, an excellent job at sort of conveying the results of many different models, and I think that ecologists, we can learn a lot from this approach. So we need to use um, um, lots of different ecosystem models and look at how they compare to some of our single species uh, models. And then I'm just going to leave this last slide up here. This is uh, a list of, of some of the studies in the North Atlantic that um, have been conducted, and it kind of gives you an idea for the trade-off that we have between GCM, the number of GCMs we can look at, the number of variables that we can look at um, in these projects. Thanks. Great. Thanks a lot, Janet. So we have time for maybe one very quick question. If anybody uh, attending remotely has a question, please raise your hand in the participant list. I don't see any hands up right now. Or Taylor has a question. Eric, um, please ask your question, please. Yes, I'm interested in knowing uh, what the perspective on how important salinity data is now that we have salinity measuring satellites that can get a global coverage and how that might impact your modeling efforts. Um, as far as I know, no one's actually or really looked at salinity specifically um, in any of these, these approaches. Um, but uh, certainly for some some systems, like you can see salinity here in um, some of our more near shore coastal systems might be um, really important. I know salinity changes are an indicator of changes in zooplankton assemblage in the Gulf of Maine, for example. So it's definitely something that we thought about using to look at how changes in water masses, like as an indicator of 
changes in water masses and circulation, but it's not something that anyone has attempted yet. And just one another real quick question is, how, how um, relevant do you think your results are in extending them to shorter time scales and space scales um, as we get closer to the coast uh, and shallower waters that are going to be more responsive to surface conditions like cooling or warming? Yeah, I mean, most of the, the studies that um, I've looked at have kind of tried to um, focus on the effects of climate change rather than climate variability in the sense that, at least in the studies that I've been involved with, we averaged over sort of the 30 to 40 year time scale to average out the effects of um, climate variability. Um, but, yeah, like looking at the, the near shore, obviously, it's going to be really important to try to understand how, how those local sources yeah, and Janet uh, and Eric, maybe you guys can follow up offline with a uh, uh, little more discussion on this because we do have to move on now. But Eric, thank you for the questions, and Janet, thanks for the presentation. Okay, so um, our final speaker is Ann Hollowood. Ann, are you on the line? Ann, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, great. So I'm transferring control over to your computer right now. <laughs> Can you see it? Can you see my computer? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was muted. We can see your computer. Please just go full screen with your slides and then whenever you're ready. Okay. Okay, uh, it's loading. It didn't go full screen. Maybe try clicking that huh. presentation button again. Oh, why don't you take it back and I'll do it off of Screen one. I thought I could see both, but um, go back to screen one. Oh, and I can't control that from where I am. So maybe the best thing to do is just uh, you can flip through as they are right now. Um, They're pretty large on our screen anyway, so. No, if you can just take that control and I'll do it again. I put it on, I have two screens and I, you, okay. I clicked the wrong screen. Okay, okay, great. So I just took back control. Shift it back, yeah. And then let me know when you want me to send it back. Yeah, send it back. Okay, is that better? Yeah, it looks good. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm going to move us from from uh, an analysis of short term that Charlie presented to to sort of the retrospective studies that Janet gave you to sort of the strategy is how we look forward between now and the next IPCC cycle, which that will be due in 2021. And so uh, much of what I'll pre present today is a product of uh, ICES and Pisces uh, strategic initiative on climate change impacts on marine ecosystems uh, that I'm involved in. At, as well as the work that we're doing within National Marine Fisheries Service to develop a climate strategy that Roger Griffiths is really looking at. And, and that uh, climate, NIMS climate strategy has, is, has been written and it's currently uh, in the review stages. The line offices have a copy of it and they're, we're seeking comment for it as well as, and then it'll go out for public review uh, one of the interesting things is that we're going to have briefings at each of the major fisheries management councils. Uh, these will occur between January and March, and there's a national uh, SSC meeting that happens every year, and that uh, the SSC members all select different topics to discuss, and this year one of the topics they'll be discussing are climate change. And, and so my talk is really about how, what are our strategies for moving forward. In order to go from here to there, I need to uh, do a little bit of backup in terms of, of sort of what have we accomplished with the most recent IPCC report that just came out this year. 
Um, I, the working group two is really where the nexus between National Marine Fishery Service and the uh, physical sciences within NOAA, GFDL, as well as OAR come into play in the sense that what the IPCC tries to do is to look at, especially in working group two, is to try and look at the combined socioeconomic processes and the uh, physical processes that are expected to occur under climate change, both natural and anthropogenic, and try to assess the risks to both humans and uh, ecosystems uh, throughout the world. And so uh, th this is really where we are, need to prepare ourselves as uh, an agency looking at the effects of climate change to try and bring together the different aspects of the government to try and do a good job at trying to look at these risk assessments. Uh, it's not a surprise that uh, the uh, global climate change, the recent report continues to show that uh, there will likely be warming uh, relative to, this is a plot from the summary for policymakers, that's this SPM, and this is the difference from the mean of 1986 to 2005, and you can see particularly in the region that I'm dealing with, which is these Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea sort of regions, you can see that warming is expected to occur depending on which uh, uh, concentration pathway you pick, you will either get extreme warming or, or moderate warming, and, and the details of this, of course, can be found in the report. But the perfect, for the purposes of National Marine Fishery Service, we're really looking at the aspects of what is going to be happening regionally. And I was uh, an author on one of the polar chapters, and so some of the things that we had to deal with was we had to look at the uh, impacts that were reported from Working Group 1, so what were the physical changes that we are expecting, and try and think about how those might uh, impact marine ecosystems or human services uh, uh, based on either terrestrial or marine ecosystems. And the sorts of things for taking an eye, of course, towards the marine environment, these are the sorts of things that we're expecting, increased temperature, there'll be increased stratification in the Arctic and the southeast Bering Sea in the summer. Uh, there'll be reduced uh, sea ice extent in the Arctic Ocean, uh, certainly w reduced winter sea ice in the Bering Sea, and that has the associated impact, and I'll show you a figure of this, uh, of the remnant cold pool that forms on the bottom that is a product of the winter sea ice in the Bering Sea. There'll be changes in the timing of the sea ice breakup and setup in both regions, which of course will change the timing of the blooms and the onset of the productive seasons and there'll be changes in the biochemical properties of the Arctic Ocean and the Eastern Bering Sea. The, to, so there's a, been a major uh, research effort within the Bering Sea that was a joint partnership between the North Pacific Research Board, NOAA, and the National Science Foundation. And, um, and within that effort, there was a uh, concert of uh, research program focused on modeling. Uh, Al Herman was the lead on the physical side of that. Uh, what he was looking at is downscaling the existing IPCC models that were available for the region and trying to look at how the, uh, how the Southeast Bering Sea marine ecosystem, what physical changes we might expect. And this is a product that is really beginning to put this all in perspective. The question for us in, in the fishery service is, well, what will change and, how, and what will be the interannual variability of that change in order to place that into our models in a reasonable way? So what this is, is this is a, a typical cold year in this panel. This is a summertime look retrospectively of a, of a typical cold conditions across the Bering Sea Shelf and, and 
this is a typical average year, and this is a typical warm year. And the plot over to the lower uh, lower right then gives you a, the projections that L has made using three. These were from AR4 models uh, of what were the downscaling uh, climate scenarios from these uh, three different three projection models, three projections of cl future climate change, and looking at how that would play out in terms of the sort of average temperature across the Bering Sea shelf. And these lines show you the cut marks for the typical cold, medium, and warm ocean conditions. And I think this is a take-home message for all of us in that it shows really three aspects that you can think of from this. First is that there will continue to be a large degree of interannual variability across the Bering Sea Shelf, that it isn't just a one-way trip. The second piece that you can see from this is that all three of the model trajectories, whether you're using the Canadian model, the Japanese model, or the German model, all of them suggest that over time in the next 40 years, uh, in between now and 2040, you will see an increase in temperature overall. The last piece of it is, is that there's a difference between how uh, steep these models will, how steep this warming will ac actually manifest itself across the Bering Sea. And at least two of the models will begin to see a situation where we no longer see cold years as early as 2025, 20, 2030. 20, and that is really a, a real take home message for all of us within National Marine Fisheries Service that it's possible that we are going to begin to see a system that no longer has these strong cold pool events, which have profound uh, impacts on the structure of the Southeast Bering Sea ecosystem in this region. And so we need to, the, message I take from this is that we need to prepare now for a future that could be realized in the next 10 to 15 years. So in the National Climate Assessment that was completed in 2014, as well as the uh, much of the work that was done for the IPCC, uh, we were drawing primarily on vulnerability assessments. Uh, evidence of past response and agreement uh, between different papers looking at potential mechanisms uh, and looking at the projected response to, of marine species to uh, climate change based, based on e existing models and conceptual models. And really, uh, I think Janet's talk gave you an idea of the range of the types of retrospective studies that have been done that could that were, were uh, used in putting together the National Climate Assessment as well as the IPCC. The uh, prototype management strategy evaluations, there were a few of them, but as Janet noted, there really aren't a lot that truly couple the effects of fishing as well as climate change on marine ecosystems. And, Certainly the effort between t now and 2019 or 2021 is certainly the focus of where we want to go. This figure here is just a schematic showing sort of the vision of the elements of where we need to go in ter as an a agency, uh, a one NOAA agency, to develop an operationalized projection framework for looking at the impacts of climate change. and. The arrow here sort of indicates where where essentially we are now, and the rest of my talk is really going to be thinking about where can what do we need to do to to move to the point where we're actually at this operationalized framework in a timeline that's that's useful for the next assessment. The the types of implications of climate change uh, the, these are sort of the categories of research that I think all of us within National Marine Fisheries Service need to think about. Uh, Janet mentioned several of these, but it's useful to list them because uh, the, the research that's necessary at the base of that pyramid that I showed you on the previous slide is really important that we don't lose sight of that. Uh, the 
the key pieces of it are that we are expecting shifts in spatial distributions. We're expect, expecting shifts in the phenology, uh, whether that's changes in the timing of the spring bloom and the match of the emergence of, of uh, the hatching of eggs and, and the first feeding of larvae or, or the onset of um, maturation schedules. There's shifts in production of some stocks, and as Janet mentioned, there'll be winners and losers. This plot over here shows a retrospective of a stock that seemed to thrive under after a regime shift, Barry C. Pollock, and one that really uh, shifted to a less productive state, Tanner Crab. The, uh, there will also be the other side of climate change that is the chemical piece of it, the actual carbon uh, uh, build up in the atmosphere, which is this issue of ocean acidification. And so the combination of changes in temperature, changes in oxygen, and changes in ocean uh, pH are certainly something that we need to be following. And finally, the pieces of uh, climate impacts on the growth, mortality, and maturation schedules, which are really the elements that lead to these winners and losers. The, of course, they, these shifts don't happen, as Janet said, in a single species environment. They happen, happen within an ecosystem. And so tracking the implications of shifts in distribution on predator-prey interactions or ch shifts in abundance in terms of competition are so, certainly going to be a key feature of this. And the cumulative, tra folding all of these up into the uh, ecosystem effects on ecosystem structure is certainly the focus of the research that was going on in the uh, Bering Sea project that I mentioned earlier, trying to track these all the way from bottom up into the uh, implications for fish and fisheries. The, the important thing, I think, is that we need to recognize, and I think uh, uh, Charlie's talk gave us a, a rationale for looking at this, is, is that that there will be regional differences, and we need to think carefully about where the most pressing needs are. The, I, this is a quote from the Working Group 2 report on the polar regions, which was Chapter 28, but I think it, it really get, gives the background for where I think we need to think in terms of how we can progress from the bottom-up models that we have right now to the the whole uh, coupled fisheries and uh, bottom-up forcing type models. Uh, the idea here is that the physical and biological and socioeconomic impacts of climate change in the, uh, this chapter 28 had to deal with the Arctic have to be seen in the context of often interconnected factors that include not only environmental changes caused by drivers, other, but also by uh, in, environmental factors, I'm sorry, uh, drivers other than climate change, and, but also demography, culture, and economic development. And so the idea here is that we can't only look at uh, the bottom-up forces of climate change. We have to think of how humans themselves are going to change in the next 15 to 20 years. From a, the look at fisheries, the idea is to try and think of what scenarios are likely to occur. And this is where we really need, are beginning to rely much more heavily on partnerships with our partners in the, in the economic and social side of National Marine Fishery Service. The demand for protein is certainly going to be something we need to track as the world population increases. The, Interconnectedness of world markets is certainly something that we need to track, particularly in the realm of aquaculture. What will the aquaculture production that's, that's slated to increase quite dramatically over the next uh, 50 years, uh, how will that play into the at-sea markets, the fisheries that we're currently dealing with? The range expansions to the north are certainly uncertain, uh, and uh, these and so doing a better job of actually being able to predict how those spatial shifts will play out is certainly something we need to do. The infrastructure 
needed to access new fisheries, particularly in the Arctic, is going to be something that that is a, uh, something that needs to play into these. Even if there were sustain, sustainable stocks and uh, th th there were fisheries in the Arctic that were large enough to sustain a fishery, the idea of whether or not there would be the infrastructure to support those fisheries is something that needs to be considered. And then the last piece of it, the pieces of it are the bioeconomics considerations of, you know, what will fuel prices be, uh, what's the risk of accessing new fisheries, particularly in the Arctic, and looking at uh, how we might build sustainable fisheries in a multinational situation. Where we're going in terms of the, the modeling for this is, is uh, trying to do a better job of linking the uh, global models that uh, GFDL is working on to the downscale those to regional uh, ocean circulation models with uh, nutrient phytoplankton and zooplankton elements, and then tying those to a variety of different modeling approaches. And the reason that we're looking at a variety of different modeling approaches is that each of these have really different strengths and weaknesses. For example, the multi-species and single-species projection models have detailed fishery information in them. They track individual size classes or age classes. They look at, uh, they're very flexible in terms of the harvest control rules that we can consider. Uh, whereas uh, food web models have simpler fisheries, but of course you can track the whole predator-prey world uh, up through the ecosystem. And so our thinking is is that while you may not be able to to run a fully coupled, uh, downscaled ROMs, MPZ, full food web, and uh, top-down fishing model multiple times, you may be able to draw inference from running multi-species or single-species projection models, which can capture all that uncertainty and use in, and infer from that some of the uncertainty that you might have in the larger systems models. The other advantage of the single-species and multi-species models is that you have a real ability to look at the uncertainty in the mechanism that you're proposing in terms of cause and effect, whereas in the food web, and spatially explicit models, you're often looking at the bioenergetic responses uh, to and the local prey availability in term, terms of um, modeling success or failure. And so our thinking is, at least within the Bering Sea project, is to try and bring all of these forward. I'm dwelling on this figure because we one of the real challenges is then what should we be using in terms of these projections? Uh, in the case of the complex whole e ecosystem models, you don't want to run those multiple times, and so you need to decide ahead of time what you're going to be working with. And so I'm going to go to the next slide here. Hey, um, Anne, sorry to interrupt. This is Dan. Please try to wrap up in the next minute or so. Yes, yeah, this is the last slide. And so uh, what we're really looking at is trying to um, uh, assess what, how we, can we get the international and national community together to look at this. And so in April of this year, we had a meeting with the uh, Earth Systems Modelers and the Global uh, Climate Modeling Community to look at where they're going in the next, uh, where they expect to be going in the next five years. That we the take on in March of 2015 there'll be a a workshop that where we'll begin to look at the implications of climate change on the world oceans and that will allow us to get together to with both physical scientists as well as bio, biologists and then in 2015 in August of 2015 we we'll, we will meet to try and select those scenarios that we'll be using to try and look at that. And you can see these are the elements of what we hope to discuss in August of 2015, which would be to select a suite of species and fisheries for the assessment, to look at the projection, projected responses to climate change, what's the range of those, look at the uh, fishing scenarios, and then select the suites of models for comparative studies. And 
discuss the methods for dealing with uncertainty, and then finally to agree on strategies to address boundary issues. And so maybe I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks a lot, Anne. That was great. That really, I thought, wrapped up a lot of the topics that were raised by Janet and Charlie. So thanks a lot. Um, we're uh, quite a bit over time now. It's about 1.11, so uh, maybe, you know, if there's one quick question um, for Ann, I want to give the opportunity. Otherwise, I think we'll wrap up. Anything here in the room? I'm not seeing anything online. So uh, thanks, everyone, for attending, and uh, thanks to our three speakers. I think this was a really interesting uh, webinar, nice exploratory topic for the MAP program, and thanks again, Roger, for helping to coordinate this. Um, the MAP webinar series will continue in January. We're going to have a webinar on the topic of Arctic modeling, focused on uh, model development and improvement, and also predictions. And uh, we'll have three speakers. We're going to hear from Olga Sergianko from NOAA GFDL, Hal Ritchie from Environment Canada, and Hendrik Tolman from the NOAA Environmental Modeling Center. And that's currently scheduled for January 13th. So I hope everyone can join again. And uh, thanks again for joining today. Take care. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan.